You're listening to The Support Report with Be Present, where we share real stories from young adults and how support changed their lives. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of The Support Report with Be Present. I am your host, Justin Peters. And as you know, the goal of this podcast is to bring you the stories that will hopefully help illustrate the unique struggles that young adults battling cancer experience and how the right support could go a long way in transforming this experience. Today's guest is Mark Anthony Sapolova. And Mark, if I uh, said that last name wrong, you're going to have to come on here and, and correct me. But Mark... Uh, um, yeah, it's uh, Sepulveda. Sepulveda. Uh, it's going to be Spanish about it. Sepulveda. <laughs> awesome. Well, a little bit of uh, Mark Anthony's bio. He works in the, in the entertainment industry and is quite the jack of all trades, spending time both in front of the camera and behind it, along with doing some writing. At the age of 33, he was diagnosed with Lynch syndrome and colon cancer. Fortunately, Mark won his battle with cancer and is now using his talents to create a short comedy film called Bonus Time. The film is centered around a boy named Nate, who who has another chance at life after having colon cancer himself. With this film, Mark wants to help spread awareness about the disease and humanize the often difficult conversation about cancer. Mark Anthony, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me, Justin. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. It's an honor. You know? Yeah. Well, I'm excited to uh, help share your story a little bit. So maybe let's just start off and talking about who Mark Anthony is, maybe pre-colon cancer. What what did life look like for you? Uh, pre-colon cancer, you know, I moved to LA when I was 27. And uh, I've always loved entertainment. I love entertaining people. I am um, back in like my college days. Uh, I did like um, theater, did theater in high school, college. and um, I came out here in the tent to be an actor, still want to be an actor. I, I just love entertaining people and getting that, that rush when people like either hate it or love it, but at least you went out there and did it. And I came out here in 2007 and, um, I was, I believe at the time I'm 27. I'm 38 now, but man, I'm t- time's escaping me, you know? And I was... You know, I was really beginning to find out who I was as a person, and I'd rather be honest, you know, I grew up in a Baptist school, and I didn't really have a chance to uh, really uh, explore, how I put it, the world per se, right? And with LA, you don't need to travel the world, because the world comes to you. And for the longest time, uh, I always wanted to come out here. And when I finally came out here, everyone gave me their advice and everything, but they don't tell you one thing. And that one thing is you got to find a way to survive. You're like, oh, yeah. So I became a server. And then from there, I became a uh, researcher for uh, this uh, company called Nash Entertainment. And then from there, I started working more on sets um, as a production assistant. And when I was 30, I spent the whole year of my life actually just doing production assistant work. And if anyone knows what a production production assistant is, you are the lowest rung on the totem pole of any set you're on. And you're helping out all departments all the time. So I'm the first one in, last one out. And I'll just be kind of just, um, lack of a better term, just exhausted. And... <laughs> Bleeding all, all the way up to like when I found out I had cancer. I remember at the time when I was doing that, I had a roommate who looked at me and was like, man, you're just always on the couch. And I was like, well, I'm tired. I'm working six, seven days a week sometimes. I was like, yeah, but you're always on the couch. I didn't put two and two together until uh, I found out I had colon cancer myself mm-hmm. at the age of 33. And by that point, they already knew I, I they thought I had it by about four years. And um, colon cancer is actually one of the slowest growing of all cancers. But I have this thing also called Lynch syndrome, which is a hereditary cancer, which most people don't know about. And it can actually double the um, rate of your cancer growth. So around when I was 29, I uh, was uh, showing some symptoms. But when I was 33 and I finally got some uh, health insurance, I was an assistant cameraman by that point, and I was making some better money. And with the help of my parents, I was able to get um, some health insurance. And sure enough, that's when they uh, found out I had colon cancer. But by this point, I already had a sister that passed away. 
um, of cancer. A brother that passed away with suspicions due to Lynch syndrome. And my other brother had uh, colon cancer. He actually got six inches of his colon removed. And my other sister had uh, colon cancer. And then I had colon cancer. And I had a foot of, uh, my, I had my sigmoid colon removed. So. So do you know, um, it's, it's almost like your, your one brother who didn't get diagnosed is the lucky one in the family. And we often associate cancer with being unlucky. Uh, what's the statistics? Do you, do you know the statistics off your top of the head of people well, having colon Lynch, cancer? Or, well, or, and, and Lynch as well. Well, Lynch syndrome, it, I believe it's one out of every 300 people have it. Okay. And they Got don't it. know about it. And now uh, the statistics of colon cancer is going up. Um, with the colon cancer, people got to do because if you have health insurance and there's something wrong in that area because I got when I was 29 I was having problems and I showed a major symptom that should have been looked at um, with more care but I was 29 and I didn't have insurance at the time and I went to a doctor and the doctor said I had hemorrhoids hmm. but my brother just died and my family was very worried that when something's wrong with you go see a doctor and doctor t- tells me, he goes, hey, we don't, we don't check out for colon cancer until you're 50, you know. And by this point, my sister and my other brother didn't have colon cancer. Hmm. It was only my second brother that died. And he didn't die of cancer. So I'm more than certain when I was 29, I was having the early stages of colon cancer. And, you, you know, there's a saying, you can make yourself believe what you want. And for about four years, I was showing some major signs. And I just kept telling myself it was hemorrhoids or something else. I I already been to the doctor. They said I was too young for it. And that's one of the things that I think um, a lot of doctors, well, not doctors, but insurance companies should be critical of is that colon cancer is actually on the rise. You're actually getting younger and younger people with colon cancer symptoms. So when someone who is, I mean, I'm hearing stories all over people who are 21, 23 and once you're on stage four, I mean, that's, that's pretty rough. Not saying you can't get out the weeds. I never wanted to send, it, send out a message that you can't overcome it because I've heard stories of people that have overcome it, overcame it on, in stage four. But, you know, the best plan of action is early detection. Mm. So I'm assuming um, the symptom that you're talking about is probably a pretty graphic symptom, huh? It, uh, you know, it gets a little uncomfortable. I mean, it's an uncomfortable situation to talk about with yeah. anybody. You know, if um, if you want, I can share it, but, you know, be <laughs> forewarned, it was pretty graphic. <laughs> we'll keep it there. We'll let people um, explore you a little bit more. I know you've talked about yeah. it on, on another podcast out there, um, but, but I, I think I just want to bring the light that if you do feel like, especially something, uh, a severe syndrome like that, like, you know, go and impress your doctor because, you know, you, you had to press your doctor. Um, oh and, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I did. When, um, when I finally got my health insurance, mm-hmm. I saw my primary and my primary did all the same stuff that the doctors tell you. If you're young for colon cancer, you don't have it. They checked my liver. They checked my blood. They checked my urine. They checked my pancreas. They, they did all these tests. Came back clean. But I'm telling them, at this point, I was having a hard time using the restroom. I mm. couldn't, I couldn't use the restroom. It was, it was difficult. And let's put it this way: what I was depositing wasn't making no sense as compared to what I was eating. And, and he goes, "All right, I'm going to send you to a doctor, to a specialist." He sends me to the specialist. And you know what? Don't let doctors bully you. And if you don't know what you have. Don't be confrontational with them, but if you don't know what you have or you don't think this doctor is the best for you, say something. Because I was this weekend, I just happened to be doing a short film over the weekend, and before they found out I had cancer, literally the day the day after the next one, um, I was seeing a specialist, and this guy just kind of berated me and gave like got mad at me that I was wasting his time. He was going to a he was going to go play golf. He talked about how he doesn't even work at his hospital. He does it as like kind of a favor and didn't really believe my symptoms. Chatted, but he said I was, most of the time I was wasting his time. At the time, I was kind of like, oh, okay, well, if I'm wasting your time, then what are we doing here? He tried to convince me I had Crohn's. It wasn't until I told him my family history that his face changed. 
And I, I always remember I told the doctor, I'm like, oh, you're kind of scaring me here, doctor. And he just looked at me and was like, you should be scared. Wow. And I'm like, oh, man, that does not bode well for this guy. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, and, and that's surprising because we have so many great healthcare professionals out there, you know, so many great doctors. But, um, you know, you can't take everyone's word for granted there. Uh, mm-hmm. So you were, you were diagnosed at 33. And what, what did your cancer experience look like for that? What, what was treatment? Well, okay. I didn't go through chemo. Mm-hmm. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't need it. I went. The thing, though, that did get me upset was I was in Southern California, and my family was in Northern California, and I wanted to be by them. I kept my apartment here in Southern California, but I wanted to be in Northern California. And the I, the medical establishment I was using, it works for all in Southern California, but they have two different sectors they actually have a northern california sector and the southern california sector after i found i had cancer it was like another three three and a half weeks before i actually had surgery and that was so upsetting it's just like so political of getting my paperwork from southern california and northern california and i still had to do all the same tests yeah. because when they found out that i had it the doctor was like we need to get you in surgery this week i remember i went on a monday and he wanted me to do a colonoscopy on a wednesday and have surgery on a friday wow I have no family down here. And I was like, all right, well, I want to go up north. We found it here. I went up north. It was three weeks. It was three weeks. I had to go get a new primary. I had to go get a new, uh, I had to go get it like a, another doctor, another specialist. And then after that point, they were like, and then they okayed it. I'm like, you guys are all part of the same symptom, uh, system. And you have, you already seen this. This one doctor said I needed this years ago why am i still here and that was so frustrating i just hated that so so much Hmm. what was your what what were you feeling then like i mean obviously there's frustration but were you you scared as well i mean you you know putting off what you probably needed yesterday for another three weeks and and really probably what you knew now then what you needed probably four years ago Mm -hmm. well this is how I kind of quantitate it to myself. Lynch syndrome is still not, even to this day, widely known. Um, When that was going on, they probably didn't understand what was happening. They probably wanted to know more. Hmm. I kind of chalk it up to, hey, we have someone that definitely has Lynch syndrome. So I'm not going to say they did test. They did test on me. I wasn't like, it's a bio experiment, chemistry lab. But they're probably like, all right, what are we really dealing with and trying to learn a little, little bit more? Because uh, when I went back, like I said, I had to get a new specialist. I had to get it, sorry, a new primary. And I had to do CT scan, MRI scan. At one point, they thought I would need a colostomy bag. And um, I always remember that day. My surgeon was like, do you know what stoma is? And I was like, no. And they were like, well, you might need a colostomy bag for the rest of your life. I'm an assistant cameraman. That deals with a lot of lifting and heavy work. I'm like how am I ever going to work again? Mm. I don't, I, I don't get this. And, and at the time my sister was moving uh, down from Seattle to California. Well, subsequently she left California and then moved back to Seattle, but she was down moving down here with her family and stuff. And, um, you know, as I'm talking about this, one of the things that helped me go by, by this was like having a good base of people. First and foremost, I thank God for being on my side. And secondly, I think it's a toss up. It's a close second, but I think my doctors and my, and my family and mm-hmm. friends, they're all, they're all, they're all together in there because I had a good base of people because when I found out that I might needed a, a colostomy bag, oh man, I thought my life was over. I'm like, how am I ever going to date anybody? Who's ever going to love a guy with a colostomy bag? What am I ever going to do with this? But what's there? I mean, I, I got to change my whole life plan. I got, I can't, I can't do what I want anymore. And that's what I thought you were supposed to do when you're alive. That's what we're put here to do, right? Is to go after our passions and dreams and do this. And now I can't do that. Or at the very least, find a different way of doing it. I was, uh, I went through a whole range of emotions. I was upset, sad. Um, The doctors prescribed this stuff called Lozapan. And I I don't take drugs or anything, but I just remember my, uh, the primary I had, gave me a lot of this loads of pain. I never tried it. I remember taking one and um, taking one 
And the best way I can describe the feeling was I had all this emotion and anger and just kind of like, yeah. I don't get what's happening. I honestly know I need um, to get uh, this cancer out. Why is no one doing it? <laughs> Took this little pen. And then I was kind of like, you know what, Mark, you give it your best shot. Maybe it's time to let the, let your guards down and, and just uh, let uh, whatever comes come your way. We'll take it after that. And I was like, but then as soon as the load of pan wears off, I go, like, what the hell was I thinking? I couldn't be doing that. I got, I got things I need to do. <laughs> Sounds like you're like going through like preteen uh, feelings again. It is. It is. It is. It's all preteen angst. It's like, well, no, I can't move my back. No way to top it off. I'm back in my parents' house. So, yeah, definitely. <laughs> That's hilarious. No one understands me. <laughs> my, my, my parents don't understand me. <laughs> so you've talked about great support already, uh, friends and family. You know, what – what specifically did that look like? What, uh, you know, how, how were people uh, a good support for you? This is a really important thread in our podcast and the mission that we have here. So we, I'd love just to hear a little bit about, um, you know, what great support looked like for you. Um, I have people call me all the time. That really helps. Um, there, I'm going to try to equate this. I'm going to see if I can make this full circle. Um, there's a saying that Stephen King said one time, a quote, that says, hey, to support somebody and their dreams or aspirations, it's, you don't necessarily have to give them money or anything like that. You just got to tell them, hey, man, you can do it. And sometimes that's all a person really needs to get it done. I had high school friends, family, cousins and stuff, great family telling me, hey, man, this is going to work out. This is going to be okay. And I already had two other siblings that went through it, and they're alive and well and have families of their own. So I had, um, that to look up to and be like hey listen dude it's not all bleak it's not all set in stone we don't know and you know medical improvements happen every two years even when my brother had it compared to when i had it it was different you know and it had like, medical advancements and stuff so and one of the major through lines that you need to have anytime this is happening is a sense of humor if i always love to laugh I always try to laugh. Um, it keeps me from crying. No. Uh, but though, have a great sense of humor about everything, you know? And if you have a great sense of humor and have really good friends or need a friend or someone to talk to, go out there. Um, right now, I'm trying to make a movie. And as I'm going through my Instagrams, I'm trying to get people to just look at it. And one of the stories I go to is like colon cancer hashtags and Lynch, Lynch syndrome hashtags. And some people I talk to on there and I tell them, you know, you have no one to talk to here. I'm here to talk to, to you. Some people have, some people haven't, but have someone to talk to, let your feelings out, get a listening ear, <laughs> you know, someone show empathy and sympathy. And I had that. I had that in spades. I had that in spades to my family and friends. And I am truly blessed to have had those people in my life. Because without that, that teenage angst I was feeling at age 33, I don't know what would happen. Mm. Is there is there a, a wrong way to reach out? You know, if, there, if somebody's worried, if, if, if they had a friend that got diagnosed and they want to pick up the phone and call them, um, but they might be worried that they might be coming across uh, the wrong way. Uh, you know, in your experience, when people are reaching out to you, what, was there any way that, that people messed it up or were you, you know, okay with anybody trying to approach it, whatever direction they uh, need to approach it? You know, it? I, I can only speak to myself. Today. Sure, please. You know what I mean? I can only speak to, my, to myself. Uh, I, I, me as a person, I wear my heart in, as an open sleeve. Hmm. And some people were kind of like waiting me to say something. Some other people came and said, hey, man, I heard what was going on. So that being said, if people came to me and asked me, hey, I heard this is happening. Yeah, I'm going to tell them my story of what was happening at the time. But if you are wondering about it, just call these people or write them. If you feel weird about saying anything about it, just convey, hey, you ever need anything may not be monetary needs but you just need someone to talk to or want to talk about a movie you know if that person really needs to talk to you 
they'll talk to you and it'll come up organically hmm. because you sometimes when you don't need anything you just need someone there yeah. you know just uh listening here whether it be for the cancer or not and i had that a lot i had that a lot and, and it was rough you know it was rough for my family because now i'm the like fifth person to have this and my mother she's an older lady and it was very rough on her hmm. and I, I remember when i got my when they, they found it, I was doing this thing called a Flagstaff test, and the doctor was putting this camera up my bum, and uh, he was like, oh, you got cancer. You got a lot of cancer. Mm. First of all, that's the wrong thing. A doctor should never say that to a patient. But the first thing that went to my mind was like, the first thing, I think it's uh, priority shifted, but the first thing I said, I remember, was like, this is going to be, like, my mom's going to be so mad. And he was like, screw your mom. Worry about your life, kid. Mm. But I'm like, I can't. I can't help it. My mom has been through so much, and I, and I don't want to be this discourse of pain. But since I had such a big base, it weren't, it was not only able to help me go through it, but help my mother go through it as well. Hmm. Oh yeah, um, that that's amazing that you thought about your mom first before you even thought about yourself. It it does seem like she went through a lot. Um, I know you talked a little bit about whenever your oldest sister was diagnosed, um, and, and you were six, and and she wasn't necessarily there for you academically, uh, and whatnot. But but you realized that she was going through a lot in that situation right there. Um, so yeah. yeah, even as even as a kid, because like I said, my sister passed away when I was like six, six or seven. Mm -hmm. I think I was six. Um, she had a lot of stuff to deal with. As a kid, I just wanted a mom, mm -hmm. you know. And hell, even as an adult, yeah, um, I don't want my mom like I wanted when I was six, but I want to know that they're okay. You know, I even now with everything going on in the state of the world, I still I still feel for them. Even just recently, um, I just went back. And like I said, they're older people. I went back because my brother went back to work. He's usually living with them. I made sure they had groceries. I was cooking for them, helping with the yard work and everything. And um, try to spend as much time as I could with to help them out. I mean, family is a big part of my life, and which helps incorporate my uh, movie entertainment. Yeah. So let's talk about your movie. And um, before we talk specifically about bonus time, I'd love to talk a little bit about what it is about movies and comics. Uh, that really excite you? I mean, it seems like from an early age, uh, you loved movies and comics. So is there something yeah. about them that, that you can pinpoint? Um, yes, definitely. So when, I, I'm also dyslexic. So um, I remember as being a kid one time sitting on a stoop and when people talked about movies, it's kind of going like, people make movies on purpose? <laughs> And these things aren't real. And we're all okay with this. Okay. <laughs> okay, I can I kind of grasp that. And I just always loved movies as a kid. As a kid, I remember there used to be this channel called TBS that would show movies. When Fox became a network, I remember they would show movies every night. I was glued to that television. I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. But as I got older, I realized I like entertaining people. I could do it. Um, am I the best entertainer? No, but who is? It's, it's artwork and art form. And going to like comic books, I thought that was just the bee's knees. I remember even before I wanted to be an actor, I wanted to be an artist, but I don't have the best hand and eye coordination. Mm. But man, I, could, I believe I can think of a story. I think I could make some things happen. And um comic books has been more of a crutch in my life every time something big has ever happened i've always found myself leaning on comic books even to this day i ha i had a relationship that was just kind of hard for me and i found myself back at comic books again mm. i'm like why do i find myself back at comic books every time something bad happens i don't know maybe because they're always there since the childhood maybe that's something i can have control of and as entertainment as uh, being someone who loves movies, who doesn't like to get entertained? Who doesn't like to be in their seat and taken out of a situation? I can remember a lot of times where I did bad on a test. I'm a horrible speller. I'm a, I was horrible at math. I would watch Pan's Lab, not Pan's Lab, I'd watch The Labyrinth. Or I'd watch Terminator or Robocop, Predator. Maybe I shouldn't be watching those as a kid, but I loved them. 
<laughs> Wizard of Oz, Willy Wonka, this whole surrealism, this whole thing that, you know, let's dive into this, uh, just a whole other world. And I was just captive ever since. And I remember doing my first play. I think I played John the Baptist as a kid in fourth grade. The only reason I got that part was because I was tall. <laughs> I got held back. I got held back. And I was a college kid there. And like, John the Baptist was tall. Can you play John the Baptist? And um, I just, I don't know. I like entertaining people. Yeah. Even when I started getting in high school and stuff, doing plays and stuff, I just, I was like, man, the, the thrill and the rush and the butterflies. And when you can pull it off, that thrill and excitement, that's an adrenaline rush. Mm. Yeah, I can tell you're an entertainer. You're jumping out of your seat right now. We're across cameras and I'm like, and you're, you're, you're moving, you're jumping. Anybody that's watching video uh, will, will definitely probably validate that. I can tell you're very expressive and, and um, I love that about you. So let's talk about, um, let's talk about bonus time. So uh, in, in the intro, I mentioned it's a, it's a story about Nate uh, that, had, that overcame colon cancer, that be, had a, a battle with colon cancer, um, and now he's got a second chance at life. Is this correct? Mm -hmm. no, it's, it's correct. One of the things that we're trying to do with the story, obviously, is making awareness of colon cancer and Lynch syndromes. But what I like about our story, which, what is different, is you do get a lot of stories that talk about cancers. And going through cancer what our story does is life after cancer there is life after cancer no one really talks about mm. what do you do life after cancer mm. you know and not only do we show you more than the glimmer of hope it's what do you do after that glimmer of hope's there great we got it we defeated cancer now i gotta go apologize to some people because now i'm going through some emotional stuff where you know, I've been on the brink of death's door, and I wasn't on the brink of death's door. They said I only really had a 9% chance of really dying on the operating table, and I think that goes across the board for any type of cancers you do. I think you have a bigger chance of dying in a car than you do having um, colon cancer surgery, right? But going through there, how do I put it? Going through it, you're reeling. Going through that teenage angst. You're reeling and stuff. And you're like, hey, man, there's some things in my life that need to change for the better. And granted, you know, it's been five years. I'm trying to keep, keep the same mentality and same, like, hey, man, keep it cool type of thing. I'm not the best. I'm only human. Mm -hmm. But these are things that you deal with after cancer. You know what I mean? And our character, he is trying to uh, better himself as not to get cancer again. And he's going back apologizing to people, whether they, they want the apology or not, you know. Mm. And through this journey, you understand a little more about colon cancer. You understand more about Lynch syndrome. You understand that this guy is fooling himself into thinking that, hey, if uh, I apologize to everybody and get good vibes in here, cancer should be done, right? Not necessarily so, man. Myself, I have Lynch syndrome. I got to think about that every day, every day. I got 20% of my brain thinking about checking my body out at all times, wondering what the hell that cough was, wondering why my bones are aching a, a little bit weird. Yeah, granted, it could be I'm getting older, but there's symptoms that go with cancer, mm -hmm. you know, like, hey, does my stomach feel right? Does my head feel right? What's going on over here? I'm constantly battling that. That will never go away, you know, and... I also, with Lynch syndrome, I have to come with the fact that I'll probably get cancer again. And the only way to keep on top of that is constant monitoring because of, uh, of this disease. And that's what my, char my character, Nate, has to understand. He has to come to realize, A, apologizing is not as easy as it looks on TV. It isn't like a one big kumbaya, like, hey, we got done this, I did it, we're coming to the great store. No. People still going to have upper, they're, they're still going to have, uh, they're still going to have their own uh, perceptions of you after the cancer. Yes, you want cancer, great job, but you're still an asshole. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Uh, we use that word a lot around here, like the no pun intended, because they're dealing with the asshole problems for assholes. Kind of like in our script here. So, uh, 
it's I guess it's fair to assume that uh, you and Nate are are parallel in this story here. Um, there's a lot of similarities. I don't think I was as big of a jerk, but I definitely do have a different perception of life. And even as time's going on, it's still a hard pill for me to swallow. Mm. If I had to be honest, mm. I would like to be a better person. I am trying to be a better person. I still fall in my same traps and every once in a while, but as I'm getting older and things I've conquered and done through, I've gotten wiser to understand some of those same traps are there and I understand my shortcomings and I don't go near that. I don't try to embrace that or take that head on, you know, mm -hmm. trying to deescalate situations, not escalate, whatever that may be, Makes you know, sense. whether it be meeting somebody, whether it be friendships, whether it be uh, family matters. And that's mm -hmm. one thing that uh, this movie does because coming from a Latino family, you got a re big range of emotion that's constantly going there. Um, I mean, every Thanksgiving is kind of, as I'm getting older, it's just getting a little more like, all right, <laughs> next year, you take that turkey wing, I'm going to open my mouth. <laughs> I'm going to say something about it. This casserole's mine. We're all in agreement on that? <laughs> That's hilarious. Well, I, I'm so glad you're you're taking on, um, you know, taking on the fact of bringing some awareness to Lynch syndrome and, and colon cancer, and also showcasing life after cancer as well. Most of the big Hollywood films that I've seen that are built around cancer, uh, the film ends with with that person passing away. And uh, there's, I can't think of a story where someone overcame cancer. Uh, and then they have to start dealing with the problems of, of, of you know, post-survivorship and, and what that looks like. So uh, I'm, I'm really excited to see the film whenever it comes out. Is there a timeline for the project? Um, you know, we're still trying to get funding. We're hoping to start shooting in September. Okay. Um, September 14th is when we're hoping to start shooting. But we're talking to some nonprofits and, you know, any other nonprofits that want to get on board. We would love to have your help and support, especially during times right now. And we're in talks with, uh, we're trying to get in talks with some management uh, people because, you know, we're trying to get a name on it. That'd be, that'd be great to try to get attached to this thing. But um, come hell or high water, we're making this project. And September 14th seems like the date that we want to start on it. It's going to be about a three or four day shoot. And I got a wonderful team. Can I take a moment just to yeah, talk please. about the team that I have? Yes. The team that I have is such a great team and such talented people. And uh, to, to begin off, um, you know, to give a little pre-context, I, I started writing the story five years ago. I had cancer five years ago. The story has changed and transformed dramatically from what I had five years ago until now. Mm -hmm. And um, I went through two writing partners. And the writing partner, who is now becoming the director of the film, his name is Alex Tano, and he actually has a movie that's out on Amazon. It's called Elephant, and he got 4.5 stars rating on there. It's a really wonderful movie, and he's a huge up-and-comer. He's working on some other um, independent films, and a major asset. I, this guy is, has really taken on the reins of being a director and then some, and I met him actually on set about three years ago, um, on this short film called Sir, they was trying to start off as a pilot, and I played a chef. And he, he, I got three big fans in the world. One, my mom. Second, it's gonna be that guy. And third, it's gonna be our director of photography, which we just uh, uh, lost him with the whole team being okay. His name is Riley Reese. You can check out his Flickr account. Um, I don't know the name of his Flickr account, but the man is in love with a beautiful picture. Mm. He actually got me into, he's 10 years younger than I am. And we were doing a show out in Texas and he actually got me into the camera world. I was a production assistant and one day he looked at me and he's 10 years younger than me. And at the time, this was about eight years ago, he was like 21. I remember looking at him, he's like, hey, what do you want to do for the rest of your life? <laughs> and he got me helping him with cameras and he helped me become an assistant cameraman. Wow. In there. And, but though, He's an amazing, amazing director of photography. He has done a lot. And we actually had a, a short film we did in 2012. And he's just grown since then. 
and takes a beautiful, beautiful pictures, knows his cameras in and out. He knows what we're looking for. He knows, I, I made my whole team watch that movie, uh, Me, Earl, and the Dying Girl. Mm. I use that as a major inspiration about the look that we want. And uh, we want to try to uh, not just pay homage to that, but be like a forerunner to it. Mm. And maybe push it, make, make it better. And then I got to give a shout out to my producers. One, his name's Steve Saunders. He's actually producing uh, this movie with another another gentleman. <laughs> Excuse me if I'm talking weird. I know I told you before. I just had a root canal and two teeth pulled out two days ago. So my mouth is still a little... So far, sore. you've done okay. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, wait until you, five days from now, you're going to hear me say, hey, what's going on? I didn't know what that was. I was like, <laughs> a little baritone. It was uh, a moximum or whatever. But uh, I come back to Steve Saunders. Love him. He's a great dude. Uh, He's producing uh, another short film with uh, a, a Chinese uh, company, I think. And I met him through improv. We've known each other for seven years. And our, one of our newest members to the team is this woman named Orla Manning. And man, she's going to get this movie made. Mm. She, uh, she has been a huge asset. She is a wonderful, wonderful producer. She has worked on a lot of projects. She worked on um, Rebel Without a Crew documentary for the Al Ray Network. She actually does a lot of work out and I believe in South Africa. It's either Africa or South Africa teaching children uh, how to make movies over there. And she uh, worked for the Hillary Clinton campaign back in uh, 2016 and um, she got a lot of uh, producer credits under her belt for reality TV. This is actually her first I think uh, for reality TV and documentaries. I think this is our first sexual adventure into uh, something scripted. Okay. And I, I mean, we got big plans for this. We're not just making a short film. We're trying to make this into either into feature length or into an info or into a series. Oh, we nice. want like a series for Netflix. Like, we're going to be shopping this around because we believe this has huge potential. And if none of that ever happens, the very least, I hope we can save some lives. Mm. The very least. Mm. Hope some people just wise up to what Lynch syndrome is. Yeah. Yeah, I can't wait. Um, and uh, we'll put some links to some of the uh, different ways that they can find a little bit about bonus time. But why don't you share with the audience uh, uh, some of the best places to connect with you to follow you along on that journey? Oh, yeah. Um, you can look for us at uh, bonus underscore movie. Under, no, sorry. Bonus underscore time underscore movie at, uh, Instagram, uh, on Instagram. And you can look for Bonus Time the Movie on Facebook. Um, my tw Twitter handle is, uh, I believe it's, oh my God, I remember. There's so many of these things. Because you also can find me on LinkedIn. And you can just look for Mark Campin, it's Colvin on LinkedIn. And if you look for Mark411, I believe that's Twitter. I don't use Twitter as much as the other as the uh, other sites. I use Instagram way more. And then secondly, I use Facebook. And then if I have time to put stuff on, I'll put stuff on Twitter and everything else. Okay, so Instagram, Facebook, great places to find you. Uh, you have a hilarious little pitch video out there on Facebook. I, I, I liked watching that. So uh, I'll tease that out for the audience. I think you should go check that out. I, you did a great job in that piece. Um, you know, we, we did that really quick. And I mean, if anything, that just shows you, we got, that was a whole different DP and director and stuff. Um, well, the director was still there. It's the same director, Alex. But that's just a tidbit. And that was with the low budget and heavy heavy time constraints to do it and that's just just a, a fraction of what we are planning to bring mm. yeah I, I i can't wait for this um as we conclude this episode i want to ask you one more question um i heard you quote um on another podcast fall down six times get up seven uh so mm -hmm. i'd really like to end this uh conversation with you just explaining a little bit about what that is and and telling us uh, a little bit of advice around that piece. All right. I read this book. It was the author of Chicken Soup. He uh, made this book called Principles of Success. Mm. And that book is littered with such great advice. If you are in any other industry other than the movie industry, because when you're in the entertainment industry, there's more than one way to skin a cat. Mm. But the side notes you take from that book are all the beautiful inspirations, which holds true to the entertainment industry. And the one thing, one of the quotes in there was a Japanese proverb 
that said, fall down six, get up seven. And I've been in LA for about 14 years now. I've been rejected. I've had family members die. I've gone through cancer. I've gone through breakups, firings in the, in the, well, just quitting uh, jobs, really trying to look and find myself. The one thing that brings me happiness is what I came here to do. And I, this movie is, I call my masterpiece. It took all that experience of all that rejection from people, family. I still got people today telling me to give up and not try. Mm. Even to this day. All falling down. But you get up and every time you come back, it's stronger. You get stronger. And when that happens, man, you're going to get a heart. You're going to be happy with what you got. This is my masterpiece. I've fallen down six times. I'm getting up seven. Hell, I might even fall down 20 times. I get up 21 times. But every time I get up that, that next time, I'm stronger than I was before. And that next time might be the time. Mm. You just got to stick with it. Mm. That's awesome. There's, that... a, there's a movie out there that did a really good job of that. It was a sommelier movie about this gentleman. Long story short, this guy, he, his father owns a rib company, and he wants to be a sommelier. He does it, doesn't make it, but he goes right back the next year and tries again. And this time he is knowledgeable and knows what's going on. And it's like, now he's ready. And that to me is fall down six times, get up seven. Hmm. I think that's a beautiful way to end this podcast. Mark Anthony, it's been a pleasure having a conversation with you. Hopefully uh, the audience will connect with you, find them um, at bonus time, you know, both on Instagram, Facebook, we'll put those links below so they can easily find you. And uh, I'm looking forward to whenever bonus time is a release, giving it a listen and, a, and giving it a watch. We're aiming to release next year, man. We're hoping to release next year if everything goes right. Awesome. Well, it's been a pleasure. Uh, thanks again for giving us some of your time and, and sharing your story. Justin Peters, thank you for having me on here and allowing me to share it.